Uh, the Committee on House Administration will come to order. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, the members of the committee for joining us today. As we begin, I want to note we're holding this hearing in compliance with the regulations for remote committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 8. Generally, we ask committee members to keep their microphones muted when not speaking to limit background noise. Members will need to unmute themselves when seeking recognition or when recognized for a uh, purpose of questioning our witness. I want to remind my colleagues that please keep your cameras on at all times. Even if you need to step away for a moment, please do not leave the meeting or turn your camera off. I'd also like to remind everyone that the regulations governing remote proceedings require that we cannot participate in more than one, one committee proceeding at the same time. I'd like to note that tomorrow marks 100 days from the horrific insurrectionist attack on the United States Capitol on January 6th. Among other steps taken by the House to respond to the attack, the Committee on House Administration has assisted and monitored two important reviews which were undertaken at the same time. First, the House engaged Lieutenant General Russell Honore and a team of highly decorated and experienced former military and other leaders to assess capital security. Second, and at the same time, immediately after the, the attack, U.S. Capitol Police Inspector General Bolton set aside his team's ongoing work to focus on an urgent review of the department's performance related to the attack, including its preparation for and response during the attack. Inspector General Bolton recently provided his initial findings to congressional oversight committees in the form of, quote, flash reports. Both of those reviews and their initial findings and recommendations have been shared with members on a bipartisan basis. We will review and study them carefully as part of our oversight responsibility to the House. The purpose of today's hearing is to hear directly from the Inspector General of the U.S. Capitol Police uh, to, to see what he found out about the department's uh, preparations for and response to the attack. But as we undertake this review, we must not forget why there was an attack to respond to in the first place. Who said this? Quote, American citizens attacked their own government. They used terrorism to try to stop a specific piece of democratic business they did not like. Fellow Americans beat and bloodied our own police. They stormed the Senate floor. They tried to hunt down the Speaker of the House. They built gallows and chanted about murdering the Vice President. They did this because they had been fed wild falsehoods by the most powerful man on earth because he was angry he'd lost an election. There's no question that President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of that day. And that was Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Senator Mitch McConnell, who said this, former President Trump, quote, incited that bloody insurrection for nothing more than selfish reasons. He claimed voter fraud without any evidence and repeated those claims, taking advantage of the trust placed in him by his supporters and ultimately betraying that trust. And that is, former speaker John Boehner, who said this, quote, January 6th was clearly an attack that was attempted to stop the counting of electoral votes. It's very important for people to realize that a fundamental part of the Constitution and as who we are as, as Americans is the rule of law. It's the judicial process. The election wasn't stolen. There was a judicial process in place. If you attack the judicial process, you attack the rule of law. You aren't defending the Constitution. You're at war with the Constitution. And that was Congresswoman Liz Cheney, the Secretary of the Republican Conference. Those descriptions of the attack and its significance are the, are the recent words of Senate uh, and House Republican leaders, uh, not Democrats. Former President Trump's actions inciting and encouraging the domestic terrorists who attacked the Capitol are why bipartisan and historic majorities in the House and Senate concluded that it was both constitutional and necessary to impeach and convict 
former President Trump for those actions, including his false statements, and to disqualify him from holding future office. That proceeding was about accountability for former President Trump. The Department of Justice is pursuing accountability for the attackers. FBI Director Chris Wray has described the attack as, quote, political terrorism. So far, hundreds of people have been criminally charged, and federal prosecutors have described this effort as, quote, likely the most complex investigation ever prosecuted by the Department of Justice. But today's hearing is about accountability for and oversight of the U.S. Capitol Police's role in performance in responding to the attack and keeping the Capitol safe. Unfortunately, as we will hear from the Inspector General Michael Bolton, his initial review has found that the department's preparations for and response to the attack were deficient in several key respects. His initial findings differ significantly from prior versions of events offered by department officials, including in congressional testimony, and they detail what he believes to be a number of critical shortcomings by the department and its leadership. The deficiencies and inadequacies the Inspector General has identified to date can be characterized in four key themes. One, training. Two, planning policies and procedures. Three, intelligence. And four, leadership and culture. Today's hearing is focused on the U.S. Capitol Police, but let us be clear that our important and necessary view of the department's performance as an institution and its leadership does not diminish the courage and the valor of the men and women who so bravely fought to defend the Capitol on January 6th. Officers lost their lives as a result of this horrific attack. S scores more, not just from the Capitol Police, but other responding agencies suffered grievous injuries. For example, offers, officers were viciously beaten with flagpoles, including some displaying Blue Lives Matter flags and American and the American flag. They were assaulted with powerful bear spray and other chemicals. An officer was crushed in a heavy door as he was attacked. An officer uh, who was, was beaten so badly, she lost consciousness. Another officer lost an eye. Another lost fingers. Another officer had his own taser used against him to the point that he suffered a heart attack. Dozens of officers contacted COVID, an illness that we're still coming to fully understand, but that doctors believe can have serious long-term effects, including significant neurological and cardiac problems. In our nation's history, six citizens have lain in honor in the Capitol Rotunda. Of those distinguished Americans, four, were U.S. Capitol Police officers who made the ultimate sacrifice to protect the nation's capital. Two of them, Officer Brian Sicknick and Officer William Billy Evans, made that sacrifice in just the last three months. This afternoon, as Officer Evans was laid to rest in Massachusetts, let us remember and honor their memories, and let us all work together to make the Capitol Police Department stronger and more effective, not just to keep the Capitol and those who work here safe, safer, but to keep the men and women who wear its uniform safe as well. The January 6th attack was a horrific, traumatic event for everyone who was present, their families and loved ones, and those who witnessed it for the whole country. I would like to take a moment to remind all members and legislative branch staff that counseling and other assistance is available to you should you need it. I would now like to recognize our ranking member, uh, Mr. Davis, for the purposes of providing an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And before I get started, I want to take a moment to also thank our Capitol Police officers. On Tuesday, we honored the life and service of Officer Billy Evans. The death of Officer Evans follows the tragic deaths of Officer Sicknick and Officer Liebengood. To say it's been a difficult few months for our officers would be an understatement. Our officers on the front lines need to be commended. Not a single staffer or member was physically injured on January 6th, and that's because our officers did their jobs. I have heard from so many of our officers and know that many are struggling. For every single officer that is watching, please know 
that the job you do on a daily basis does not go unnoticed. You are appreciated, and please don't be afraid to seek the help that you need. As someone who knows how traumatic events can impact our mental health, know that professional assistance can make a big difference. With that said, I'm glad we're having this hearing today. It's long overdue. It's been more than three months since the attack on the U.S. Capitol. And this is the first hearing this committee is holding on the issue. This committee that has primary jurisdictional oversight of the U.S. Capitol Police, House Sergeant at Arms, and the architect of the Capitol. Although I'm glad we're having this hearing, I think we've skipped a step. This committee has not heard from anyone involved in the decision-making process surrounding January 6th. Our members have not been able to question under oath any former or current leaders within the U.S. Capitol Police or House Sergeant at Arms. This is critical to our oversight of these entities. The night of Jan the day and night of January, the night of January 6th, I actually spoke with uh, Chairperson Lochran and Speaker Pelosi on the floor about working in a bipartisan way to ensure an attack like this never happens again. They agreed. Unfortunately, that was the last bipartisan conversation we had regarding January 6th in the House, despite my efforts to keep the conversations going. Since then, at the direction of the Speaker, Preservation and production requests from my office have not been honored by the House Sergeant at Arms and the House Chief Administrative Officer, both entities controlled by the Speaker. In addition, dozens of Democrat members of the House have, without any evidence, publicly accused Republican members of giving would be rioters reconnaissance tours of the Capitol on January 5th. To my knowledge, there has uh, there there has unbelievably been little to no effort by Democrats to determine if there is any merit to their accusations or if these were just reckless accusations made for purely political reasons. I, for one, would like to know the truth. But as I mentioned, this is the first hearing that the chair has called on the issue of January 6th, more than three months after the attack, despite my continued calls to work with the chair to address security failures. While the House Sergeant at Arms and the CAO denied my preservation and production requests related to January 6th, the U.S. Capitol Police has complied. After reviewing much of the video footage and documents provided by the USCP, I will be releasing a series of short reports. These reports will detail the security failures leading up to and on January 6th, as well as make recommendations to ensure the Capitol is better protected. One major area that has bipartisan agreement at least in the Senate and among House appropriators, is the need to reform the Capitol Police Board. I've said for a long time that an overhaul of the board is needed. I believe Inspector General Bolton's reports have been extremely helpful. Unfortunately, the Capitol Police Board has failed over the years to execute on his recommendations. And let me remind folks, IG Bolton reports directly to the Capitol Police Board. Like IG Bolton, I'm incredibly concerned with the USCP's lack of ability to manage and interpret the intelligence they are getting from other agencies. I also believe that the USCP must operate as a proactive protection force and less as a traditional police department. This evolution will require updated training and hiring practices to reflect the USCP's refined mission. However, we cannot even begin to implement many of these necessary reforms without first addressing the Capitol Police Board's failed structure which sequesters authority in a slow-moving organization focused on serving political ends while restricting the Capitol Police's ability to respond nimbly to emergent threats. You see from my chart here how the security structure currently works. You want to hold that up, Tears? Okay. The Speaker appoints the House Sergeant-at-Arms, who then oversees the U.S. Capitol Police. I firmly believe... I firmly believe that any indictment of the U U.S. Capitol Police's performance on and leading up to January 6th must also be a reflection of the USCP's boards, the, the Capitol Police Board's inability to meet its responsibilities in overseeing the department in the years leading up to January 6th. While we know changes would be needed eventually, the Speaker's decision to hastily ask for the resignation of the two security leaders in the House just hours after rioters stormed the Capitol has prevented us from getting answers contributed to the issues within the department and slowed their ability to adopt permanent changes. I do appreciate the chair for holding this hearing today and Mr. Bolton for being here. Securing our nation's capital should not be a partisan issue. And my offer to work together to address it still stands. 
I hope this is the first of many security focused hearings this committee will hold. I look forward to participating in this day's in today's discussion and I yield back. Gentleman yields back um, before I introduce the inspector general. I would like to note that we have been advised uh, that votes are expected in the house around 2 30 uh, and that there will be 14 votes, which means we will be voting until this evening. So if we conclude our questioning today, um, that will be fine and we'll look to further hearings. If not, we will seek a time to hold this hearing over because we want uh, to have an adequate opportunity to go through the findings with the inspector general. Uh, inspector general Bolton, I'd like you to note that your full uh, testimony uh, will be made part of the record and will remain open for at least five days for additional uh, materials to be submitted. Uh, as we know, the inspector general uh, has uh, been with the United States Capitol Police for 15 years. Uh, when the office was created in 2006, he joined as the assistant inspector general for investigations. He became the inspector general in uh, January of 2019. Prior to his service with the department, Inspector General Bolton worked at the Department of Treasury as a special agent in charge of the Office of Investigations. Inspector General Bolton also served for 21 years in the United States Secret Service, including service on the Presidential Protection Division. Uh, the committee is grateful, Inspector General Bolton, to your service for our country, and you are now uh, recognized to deliver your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Lofgren, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members of the Committee on House Administration. I appear here before you to discuss the Office of Inspector General's review of events in regards to the United States Capitol Police operation, programs, policies that were in effect during January 6. I'd like to extend my appreciation to the committee for holding this hearing. This hearing is different in many ways. I am addressing not only committee members, exercising their constitutional role of oversight, but I'm testifying to witnesses as well as survivors who are affected by the events of January 6. On January 6, a physical security breach at the United States Capitol occurred during a joint session of Congress to certify the Electoral College vote. My goal is to provide each of you with a better understanding of how the events of January 6 occurred in relation to the preparation, response, of the department. Provoking factors outside the department's control were involved. Other entities are reviewing those aspects. I will discuss the non-law enforcement sensitive findings detailed in my two flash reports. Any law enforcement sensitive questions can be answered in a closed door setting. Shortly after the events of January 6, I notified the department, board, and the committees that my office would be suspending all future projects in our annual plan for 21 to allow my entire staff to conduct a full review of these events. In order to accomplish this goal, both audits and investigations will combine their collective talents to achieve a comprehensive review of the elements within the department that played a major role in the planning and response of January 6. In addition to my staff, I brought on two additional contractors with expertise, knowledge to assist my office a retired Deputy Assistant Director of the United States Secret Service, and a retired Senior Special Agent Chief of the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Our reports are not designed nor intended to cast blame on any one individual or group. These reports are intended to be an independent, objective review of the Department's programs and operations to better protect the Capitol complex, members, staff, visitors, and the rank and file officers who have shown their commitment and bravery each and every day by keeping all of us safe. A collective effort must be undertaken to ensure that each and every officer, when their shift is over, they get to go home to their families, as well as to the safety of those who work and visit the first branch of government. Our objective for this review is to determine if the department established adequate measures for ensuring the safety and security of the members of Congress, their staff, and the comp Capitol complex? Did they establish adequate internal controls and processes that complied with department policies and procedures? 
and did it comply with applicable laws and regulations. The scope included reviewing the controls, processes, and operations surrounding the security measures prior to the planned demonstration and the response during the takeover of the Capitol building. Our recommendations are made by conducting interviews, document reviews, the combined knowledge and expertise of my staff, and following best practices throughout the federal government of those relative and agencies with similar functions of the department. We are providing the department board and committees a series of flash reports every 30 days. We are viewing each element within a department, noting any areas for improvement. We are providing any corresponding recommendations to compel the department to move towards a protective agency as opposed to a traditional law enforcement agency. At the time of this hearing, my office has completed two flash reports. The first report was a review of operational planning for January 6, including a review of intelligence gathering process required for the operational plan that related to January 6. Our second flash report focused on the Civil Disturbance Unit and Intelligence Division as a whole. We have a third flash report, which will be issued on April 30th, will be focusing on threat assessment and counter surveillance unit. We anticipate a comprehensive review will extend for the remainder of this fiscal year. Other areas of our reviews will include, but not limited to, reviews of the containment emergency response team, manpower utilization, communication, makeup and structure of the command staff, training, Security Services Bureau, K-9, and executive team leadership effectiveness, as well as many others. As our work continues, my office sees continuing areas in our findings that need to be addressed. Those areas are intelligence, training, operational planning, and a cultural change. In regards to a cultural change, we see that department needs to move away from the thought of process of a traditional police department and a move to the posture of a protective agency. A police department is geared to being reactive for the most part, whereas a protective agency is postured in their training and planning to be proactive to prevent events such as January 6. In conclusion, the department is comprised of extraordinary men and women who are dedicated to protecting our democracy, putting their lives in harm's way in order for Congress to exercise their constitutional duties in a safe and open manner. It is our combined duty to honor those officers who have given their lives and also ensure the safety of all those working and visiting the Capitol complex by making the hard changes within a department. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'll be very happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you very much, Inspector General Bolton. Uh, and this is, in fact, the time when members of the committee will have an opportunity to ask questions, and we ask members to try and uh, limit uh, that to uh, five minutes, but we will have a very light gavel um, because we really need to have an opportunity to thoroughly uh, question uh, the general. You know, among uh, the most troubling uh, findings in your report is that officers were directed by the Capitol Police leadership not to use all available equipment, such as heavier, less than lethal weapons and corresponding munitions that included the 40 millimeter grenade launcher, the 37 millimeter grenade launcher and sting ball grenades. I have three questions. Who specifically within the department issued this order and why was it issued? Two, would these heavier, less than lethal weapons have the capability of dispersing large crowds? And three, would these heavier, less than lethal weapon systems enhance the department's ability to push back the insurrectionists? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, through our uh, review, <clears throat> There was uh, information that was provided to us that it was decided that these heavier munitions, you say specifically the sting balls, uh, 40 millimeter, were not to be utilized based on um, the information that we received that they could potentially cause life altering injury and or death. Um, and if they were misused in any way that that could result in those things. Um, our feeling is that, well, 
that anything that you give a police officer can be misused. If it's misused, can cause life altering injuries and or death. Uh, the takeaway from that is let's provide the training to our officers so that they are used appropriately. Uh, as far as your other uh, part of your question, uh, certainly would have provided the department at a better posture to repel these attackers. It would put them in a better position. It would be very difficult to say it would have absolutely turned the tide, but it certainly would have gave them a better chance at doing what uh, they needed to do. Uh, one of the things during our interview process was uh, when MPD heroically showed up as what uh, came to our help, um, when some of their officers started using the very sting balls, it was reported to us that individuals were turning around and leaving. They're, they're very painful, these type of munitions. Uh, so it certainly would have helped us that day to enhance our ability to protect the Capitol. You, you said why um, the order was given not to use the less than leave weapons, but you did, were you able to identify who gave that order? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, the word we have, it was a uh, assistant dep uh, deputy chief. All right. Um, Mr. Davis, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, great questions. Uh, thank you for your responses to those from Chairperson Lofgren, uh, Mr. Bolton. Uh, and again, thanks for being here. Uh, thank you for the briefings that you've uh, hung in there to give to, to me and to, to our members. Uh, there's nothing more bipartisan than getting to the bottom of, of how we, we prevent another attack that we saw on January 6th. Uh, you mentioned in your report that the department uh, can improve recruitment and hiring and retention of officers. What steps do we need to take within the Capitol Police to do that? Thank you, sir. What are the, we need to think outside the box in, in a sense. And granted, there will be certain things that will need a ledge branch or legislative fixture in it, but we need to think of uh, recruiting those who have already have the law enforcement police uh, training, uh, whether it be a local um, agencies around here uh, that have a very robust, uh, large uh, training academy where we can offer them, in other words, assigning bonuses, for lack of a better term. Um, if they have a college degree, a 3.0, we give them X number of dollars. If they don't quite have a 3.0, then it's a little lower. Uh, we, we try to offer incentives for to bring on people and recruit them. And if they already have that training, there's, there's really no reason to bring or send them down to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, which is 12 week program. Plus we also cut out the time of the, uh, the recruitment and all of the other uh, things that go along with trying to bring people on board. And we tailor our training out in Cheltenham for those individuals that already have the law enforcement training to train them in our operations in the capital police order is unique for us uh, that way we can cut down on a time bring on individuals who are already trained then we could also offer bonuses either x number of dollars in cash or here's something for your student loan uh, and that way we can speed up uh bringing bodies on on board as quickly as we can Seem like some interesting ideas, and I, I certainly hope as we look forward to uh, to uh, solving problems and getting more officers on the force, uh, they look at some of your suggestions. Um, you know, I mentioned the Capitol Police Board earlier. Uh, can you explain the purpose of the Cap Police Board, and can you tell us, is that structure similar to other federal law enforcement agencies, or do any other agencies have a similar board? Uh Given that the Capitol Police Board is really not under my purview, um, I have absolutely uh, no um, jurisdiction with, at, with concerning the board. Uh, I report to the board, that is, that is true. Um, I'm unfamiliar with at least the agencies that I belong to who would have that kind of similar setup, uh, but this is a unique um, atmosphere and environment that we are dealing with, with since you have a House side, Senate, and the architect of the Capitol. Uh, that is certainly discussions that I understand um, 
Homeland Security over the Senate side are looking into, and I believe that they'll be re, uh, issuing a report May 1st or that's sometime around there. Um, so it is a unique uh, set of circumstances, and it certainly would be something that would should be addressed and discussed amongst the committees, but uh, I, I don't have any purview uh, over the Capitol Police Board. Okay. Uh, would you say just, or did you come across any information that would say that the board is engaged actively in the oversight of the department? Well, I do know that the board uh, holds uh, board meetings with the department. Uh, at least, at the very least, I know they are engaged uh, in the past, but they're at least monthly, they have board meetings. There are, those are scheduled. Um, so you, they, they are engaged with them. Can you tell me that, you know, just in your opinion, why, why then has the board failed to ensure the department's implementation of recommendations from some previous reports? That I wouldn't be able to opine on, but I would say that I do know that the department uh, weekly provides the board with uh, the list of open, open recommendations uh, to the board members. Um, that's as far as I, I know, as far as what, uh, again, like I said, I don't have any purview over the Capitol Police Board. I got one real quick question, last question I have before my time runs out. And I, I know uh, I'm, I'm asking about the Capitol Police Board, but I think the American people need to understand the limitations that any Capitol Police chief has uh, to address security issues here. And, and a lot of it, I believe, is due to the political appointee and political structure of the Capitol Police Board. But in your opinion, could the department implement, could the CAP Police Department implement any of the recommendations containing your reports without board approval? Uh, certainly, yes. I, I see that there would be nothing that uh, would prevent the department other than, and we are always cognizant of um, whether it be a budgetary issue or something that needs to be approved by the committees that, part, but as far as I've ever, that the board has never interfered or stopped the, the board or the department from implementing my recommendations. Okay, so the, the the department could implement some of your recommendations without that board approval. That's true and correct. Okay, well, hey, IG Bolton, thank you so much, and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. I turn now to Mr. Raskin uh, for his uh, questions. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much, and thank you to Mr. Davis for uh, convening this hearing. Um, Mr. Bolton, um, the Department of Homeland Security uh, under both uh, President Trump, former President Trump and President Biden has said that uh, domestic violence, violent extremism is the number one terror threat in the country to the American people, the kind of uh, groups that participated in the January 6th uh, onslaught and siege uh, against the capital, the, the racist, white nationalist, uh, anti-government uh, group. So we can expect that there's going to be more of this coming. Um, and uh, it looks like this pattern of violence is actually accelerating. So we've got to get this right. One of your flash reports examined the uh, civil disturbance unit and identified a number of uh, deficiencies there, including uh, a lack of adequate policies and procedures. Um, do we have a dedicated full-time professional civil disturbance unit? Um, and if not, why don't we? And do we need to change the structure of it? Uh, thank you, sir. The department currently, the way it's constituted, is the civil disturbance unit, CDU, is more or less, I would describe it as an ad hoc unit where they will pull officers from the Uniformed Services Bureau to take up those assignments. Our recommendation is that they become a standalone unit. They become, with solid policies, procedures, to training, to con not just initial training. Initial training is great and wonderful, but in order to be truly effective, you've got to have that continuous education, continuous training, retraining. Uh, that, those are important elements. They need to have a standalone unit, whatever size that the department deems appropriate, and they that's their full-time job. And then right. you, now you, you suggest in your report that service in this unit, at least in its ad hoc uh, uh, configuration today, is seen as undesirable by um, the Capitol Police officers. Can you explain why that would be and what can be done to make it a more desirable uh, assignment and uh, what effect it would have to create what you're suggesting a more permanent 
prepared and professionalized civil disturbance unit. Well, one of the ways you can actually uh, incentivize is the, the, the department certainly has the authority to designate certain units as uh, hazardous duty pay, where they will receive additional funds within their normal pay. Uh, you can classify as, uh, well, back in like the day, uh, as a uh, farms instructor for the Secret Service, we had what was called tech pay. So it was additional to incentivize to get people to want to actually belong to that unit. And if I think, I believe it, I firmly believe that when you create a specialized unit, a standalone, that receives the additional training, that receives the recognition of that they are, as you, as you would say, professionalized. That naturally is going to attract others to want to belong to an elite unit that they can take pride in, something that they can say, yes. And they have a- Can I ask you, sure. is, is one reason that we haven't done this before, that it's maintained this ad hoc status, uh, because we think that there's not been enough um, uh, violent coordinated attacks on the Capitol to justify the creation of an independent standalone unit within the Capitol Police? Is that why it's not been done before? Uh, I wouldn't be able to answer that, sir. We we haven't conducted any kind of work that would determine the, the, the mindset of the department of why they're um, kept it as an ad hoc. The uh, only thing we can do is point out that we our recommendation is that they need to become a standalone Highly trained units. I okay. Can't speak to them. I appreciate that. All right. Here's my final question for you. You've made a bunch of recommendations for reform at the Capitol Police. Can you um, highlight for us which ones you think are the most important, the most urgent, and then what you need from us as the principal committee of jurisdiction to help the department um, implement these reforms? Uh, as with, even in my opening statement and Chair Lofgren's point out, we need a intelligence bureau. Right now, it's considered an intelligence division. It, it comes under the Protective Services Bureau. It needs to be a full service, comprehensive bureau. And some of the elements, and you'll probably see in, in our subsequent flash reports where we're going to be recommending some elements within the Capitol Police to be moved over to that intelligence bureau. It needs to be elevated to a bureau level. With that said, they need additional training within the analysts who are going through the intelligence as it comes in, being trained to be able to read it, understand it, disseminate it, and have the knowledge of what... An example, tell, intelligence is like a puzzle. You get bits and pieces and you've got to formulate a picture. In all my years of experience in doing leads and advances for the president's detail, I've never saw a intelligence document that's going to say, this is exactly what's going to happen on this date, and here's where it is going to be. It's always something that you have to read in between the lines, disseminate, and you have to have trained professional analysts to be able to do that. Training is another. Training is critical to have in a, in, in a department. Think of training as your locomotive that's going to pull the rest of the department along. That's your foundation. If you have a strong foundation in training, that are professionalized, trained, and all these other units that we have, whether it be CERT, K-9, and other, those are all housed in the Office of Training. I know it's called Train Services Bureau, but supposed to be, it's Office of Training. You need to have that standalone training that is going to be comprehensive and a full service training bureau. Uh, and, and again, that would be that would fall into a lot of other different things with the training from the highest level train down to the bloodborne pathogen train. They control any and all aspects of training. Nobody does their own training, their own thing, keeps their own records. It's all done by training. Very good. The gentleman uh, from Georgia is now recognized. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Bolton, the work that you've been doing on this is very important, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, knee-jerk reaction, a lot of accusations, a lot of wrong accusations, a lot of politicis politicis politicization of this event, which has uh, uh, 
taken a, a wrong approach, I think, in uh, trying to get to the bottom of it. And I think that uh, your office is doing a very good job of looking at it very objectively. And so my first question, just a simple yes or no, um, were there requirements from standard operating, were there requirements from the Capitol Police standard operating procedures that the department did not follow on January 6th? Uh, certain yes. There, the answer to your question, yes, sir. Okay. Do you see trade-offs with, I'm sorry, <laughs> this, how did the department's uh, planning deficiencies identified in your flash report compare to other law enforcement agencies? Well, that would be difficult since I haven't, you know, reviewed other law enforcement agencies. Uh, I can only speak from experience where uh, my former um, agency, uh, the Secret Service, they were very, uh, had extremely tight internal controls in either whether it be training, equipment, uh, ammunition, munitions. Uh, they were very tightly controlled. Uh, I wouldn't be able to speak to any other uh, federal agency. Okay. Has U.S. Capitol Police responded to your uh, flash reports so far? Um, generally, when we, we produce our flash, well, flash reports are different from our normal uh, reports. Uh, just to give you a quick thing is that nor our normal reports, the de uh, department has 10 days to provide us with a comment and we insert their comments and where the flash reports, there's no requirement for that. To this date, no, the department has not formally uh, addressed our recommendations to us formally. Now that's usually uh, 45 days after our reports issued to them that they provide us with a plan of action on how they're going to uh, implement our recommendations. So as have of you, today, it's not quite time. Have you heard any anything from the Capitol Police? Do you expect them to respond, or since there's no requirement for them to respond to flash report, are are you expecting a response at all? I fully expect a response from the department. Okay. Can you describe what actions the department can do without the U.S. Capitol Police Board's authority? Are there any corrective measures that the department can implement without board approval? Uh, that would be difficult for me to answer. Um, there are certain areas I'm sure that they can implement, um, and but other areas that they, they, they may have to seek board approval and, and in that some cases to committee approval, especially if they're going to reorganize their uh, organizational chart, that would require committee and board approval. Specifically, I, I wouldn't be able to uh, tell you what specific areas that the, the, the Capitol Police can implement without board approval and or committee. Okay. Regarding the February 2021 flash report, what is a reasonable time frame for the Capitol Police to fully correct the five operational planning and intelligence deficiencies you highlighted in that report? That's difficult uh, for the department because some of those recommendations are going to require uh, committee uh, approval and or budgetary issues. So the, those are going to be dependent upon whether they, they receive the budgetary um, funds to correct these actions uh, or even uh, Committee approvals, like for instance, if they wish to elevate intelligence division to a bureau, that would require uh, committee approvals if they are altering their organizational chart. And so just to be clear, when you're talking about committee, you're talking about this committee. It, well, this committee on the House and Senate, both. Okay. What is a reasonable time frame for the Capitol Police to fully implement the 26 recommendations contained in the March flash report? Again, that's very difficult for them. It, it depends on what exactly uh, they, they feel that they can implement immediately. Um, certainly, policies, and it, to kind of answer your, go back to your other question, certainly anything policy or uh, standard operating procedures, policies, directives, that does not need board approval. So they can do anything that we have dealt with or tell them that, hey, you need to update your policy procedures. They can do those right away. Uh, they don't need board or committee approval. So those are so those areas, they can address those immediately. Again, it's really dependent on a lot of those recommendations on what are we asking them to do. So one of my concerns is, and you bring up some very good points, especially when it comes to thinking outside the box. With something like this, when you have a bureaucracy, um, it, there's a culture that needs to be addressed and changed. There's a lot of... Uh, resistance a lot of times within bureaucracies to change their culture, to change the way that they've done things for a long time. And so I think it's imperative that we stay on top of this because 
um, I think it is time to have a, a change within the department, especially going forward. Um, can you also describe what the Speaker of the House's role and involvement with the department and the board are generally? I have absolutely no purview over that, and I wouldn't be able to uh, opine on that, nor would it be appropriate for me to. Uh, our concern is strictly the Capitol Police programs and operations, and that's all we are focused on. Um, so right. I'm not asking you to opine on it, just that there's got to be some type of written rule or what is the role uh, that, they, that the speaker um, has with the department and the board uh, Generally, I'm just trying to find out what that role is. Is well, that, that something be, you can't? That would be something that would be something to, to ask the Capitol Police Board on any of that kind of uh, for any written documents or anything. Like I said, I do not have any purview over the, the board whatsoever. Um, so I would not be uh, able to address that. So I guess whatever authority the speaker has to influence specific department or board actions or policies you're not aware of or you're not able to speak on that it's not within my purview okay with uh with that i have no further questions at this time i yield back gentleman yields back mr butterfield is recognized for five minutes Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for your leadership, and thank you for convening this very, very important hearing uh, this afternoon. And thank you, Mr. Bolton, for your testimony and all the work that you do. Uh, Mr. Bolton, I, I don't need to tell you that we have a lot of work to do, and we must do it quickly. And I think that's what uh, Mr. Lattermilk was talking about just a moment ago. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, and we must do it quickly. Uh, January 6th was just absolutely unimaginable, and it can absolutely never, ever, ever happen again. I simply stated, the Capitol Police were overrun. They weren't prepared for an insurrection. And I lay that blame at the feet of the Capitol Police leadership. I lay it at the feet of the Sergeant at Arms and most likely with the FBI. I don't lay blame with the rank and file police officers. They did their jobs and they are to be commended. High ranking leadership in the Capitol Police had the intelligence. We, we, that, that is absolutely clear. They knew it. Uh, they knew it was going to happen. They, they failed to act on the intelligence. The former Capitol Police chief on, chief on January 5th uh, stated that the likelihood of violence was improbable. I just cannot fathom that. He said it was improbable. He should have known that it was going to happen. I'm so glad that the small number of Capitol Police officers that were that were present did not use lethal weapons against the mob. I may be in the minority on, on that. I don't think that I am, but I am so glad that Capitol Police did not use lethal weapons. There would have been mass casualties, police and citizen casualties alike. The simple explanation of January 6th is that the Capitol Police leadership failed to sound the alarm that an insurrection was probable. And so my question, sir, is based on your flash reports, it appears that the department's training practices are lacking. And I think you may certainly agree that the department's training practices are insufficient. Uh, if you disagree with that, please let us know. But what are the general responsibilities of the department's training services bureau? Thank you, sir. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with you uh, about the training services bureau. It is. Uh, Coincidentally, it was to look at Training Services Bureau was in our original uh, annual plan that we were going to look at Training Services Bureau uh, from top to bottom uh, until at, until January 6. Training is got to be taken seriously. It can't be an afterthought. And that's where we are kind of stand today. I'm not trying. Please don't don't um, mistake what I'm about to say is telling the committees what they should do um but investment if you want to invest dollars that's the place to invest in is training it's your foundation you can have all the window dressing you want but if your foundation is crumbling and leaking it's not going to survive your home mr bolton let me get your answer in the record on this did training deficiencies contribute to the department's inability to carry out its mission on that fateful day I believe, yes, training deficiencies put the officers, our brave men and women, in a position not to succeed. Well, 
Wow. Uh, Mr. Bolton, it also seems apparent that one of the most significant shortcomings with respect to training in the department relates to leadership training. Do our sergeants and lieutenants in the civil disturbance unit receive separate leadership trainings that focus on command tactics and responsibilities? In relation to uh, the CDU, no. That, that was what we also saw and found interesting that those sergeants, lieutenants, captains who are actually leading these platoons is what they call them. They aren't been, haven't been trained to lead a platoon. So uh, it, it kind of says, in other words, it's more than just go stand over there that when things start going differently, that you have the ability to redirect your force, realign, do what you have, and you're not doing the training. And that's why if CDU is a standalone unit, you can have them training together your Folks who are in command of that unit or that platoon, they train together, and that way, with different scenarios, would lead to a better outcome or better. Uh, and finally, and finally, how does this compare to the standard practice for CDUs across all law enforcement? Well, I haven't, you know, obviously, I, I, I'm not the inspector general for all the other, but if you look at uh, certain just on website searches. And you look at some of their training that they have, you certainly it, it's their dedicated training units that they train together and, and they're that's their sole focus, and they have the latest and greatest equipment and tactics that they can employ. Thank you, Mr. Bolton. Your answers are very clear. Thank you very much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Style is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, and thank you for being here today. I, I reviewed your report, and I agree with many of the recommendations you made. Uh, for example, the United States Capitol Police needs to reform their training process by bringing in instructors from the FBI in the Secret Service. And importantly, there needs to be a cultural shift uh, inside the Capitol Police itself. The U.S. Capitol Police, I agree with you, needs to no longer see itself as a traditional police force uh, but instead to view themselves as a protective agencies. And these are the areas in the report that I agree with you. Uh, however, after reading the report, I also uh, have a series of questions. And I have significant concerns uh, that many of the proposed changes uh, that have been recommended in the past have actually been failed to be implemented. Uh, and so if I can, let me just dive in with a couple of questions. In March of 2016, your office produced a report called the the evaluation of the United States Capitol Police Division of Intelligence and Information Analysis. And in that report, uh, you provided six recommendations that would establish adequate internal controls and processes uh, for the intelligence division. Uh, did you ask uh, Capitol Police implement those recommendations? So that's you know, our report that we were, these are the recommendations we asked them to implement or, or consider um, whether that they agree with them. And so, so, so to, so to build on that, too, was was there compliance uh, to in, to ensure um, that that was those recommendations were being implemented? Well, that's that's why uh, we do from time to time uh, to go back and do re what we call a follow up, um, which occurred, uh, I believe, it was 2019. We did a follow up on the very same thing, uh, and we know that there were certain some things reemerged and there were some additional recommendations being made. That's pretty standard practice for us. Um, we will issue a report. We allow it. it it's, we will then do what we call a follow up of the report. Now we do it, that. But, but in, in that follow up, were the, were the, was there compliance with those recommendations, in your opinion? And some of them, yes, they did. Some of them, they, they were compliant for a while and then they kind of slid off and so they reemerged as the issue. So again, okay, so, back so, so, so not perfect compliance. You're seeing some areas where there's compliance, some uh, where there's where there's room for improvement. So let me, let me keep going. So then in 2019, um, you include it, one of your recommendations, increased staffing uh, for the intelligence and interagency coordination division. Uh, was this recommendation uh, included in your previous report as well? Um, I don't recall if that was um, in our uh, previous report. I can look back on that and see if that was a pre recommendation. Uh, I'll, I'll offer to you that in my reading, I believe it was. But okay. so just, we, can, we can put a, a pin there. Uh, but it, broadly, has this recommendation been implemented? Uh, they, had, they have increased uh, some. Uh, in our uh, flash reports, we're asking them to increase uh, additional folks. Uh, we'll never provide or uh, recommend a, a 
exact number. That's really up to the, the Capitol Police Department to decide the appropriate uh, number of individuals. But we so let me, I'll the, shift gears slightly. The, the department's required to update the intelligence priorities framework on an annual basis and review the and evaluate the IPF on a quarterly basis. Is that right? That's true. And we've found that that reemerged and they were not doing that. So, so you've identified that there, there was a recommendation again, it was set forth, uh, but not fully implemented in, in your review. Right. Correct. In, in, in 2019, uh, did your office recommend that the United States Capitol Police consider requiring new sworn recruits to obtain a security clearance? That's correct. Yes, sir. And so the follow-up question, of course, did the department implement uh, that recommendation? Uh, no, sir, they did not. And did you include that recommendation again in your uh, first flash report? Uh, yes, sir, we did. So, so am I right to say that uh, the department failed to maintain implementation of the OIG intelligence recommendations, even though they were made multiple times? Uh, that would be correct, sir. Yes, sir. So, so let me let me summarize what, I, what I'm finding here today in the in the opening round of questions. A number of the past reports recommendations have been made but not implemented. And why have they not been implemented? What has been the obstacle? And I know you're not to review the Capitol Police Board, uh, but it appears to me that the Capitol Police Board has operated as a political body rather than a nonpartisan law enforcement entity. And if this is accurate, I believe it's really important that the U.S. Capitol Police Board needs to be reformed. And so with that, uh, and looking at my time, I will yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Ligia Fernandez uh, at this point for her five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for holding this important hearing soon after this the Inspector General submitted his second flash report. You know, as we get to the bottom of the horrific attack on our nation, it's imperative that we follow the facts and to properly oversee the Capitol Police's operations and take appropriate actions. We really are aided by the findings and recommendations of the Inspector General. Uh, I also wanna thank you for reminding us that what we suffered on January 6th was a direct result of former president's false claim that he didn't lose a fair and historic election where 158 million participated. And the attack was aided and embedded by those who repeatedly echoed the lie that the election somehow wasn't fair and that it was intended to interfere with our constitutional duty and to interfere with our democracy. I mean, that is the underlying basis by which we are brought here today uh, to speak to the inter Inspector General about what happened and how can we prepare better so that something as horrific as that doesn't repeat itself. So Inspector General, thank you for your careful review of the facts and suggested improvements in the report. Uh, I appreciate uh, the recommendation that the department move to a protective posture. So your report documented that the Capitol Police leadership failed to understand and prepare to address clear statements regarding the intention of the insurrectionists and white supremacists among them to use violence. So um, let me ask a few questions about those warnings of violence. Based on your review, were the officers, um, uh, the rank and file the captains, the lieutenants, were they briefed by the supervisors prior to going on duty about the level of force insurrectionists had described using on January 6th? Based on our interviews and the work so far, uh, and again, I say we, we will be, uh, we will continue, this isn't the, obviously the final report, we'll have additional flash reports, that no, the answer to your question, no, we don't, haven't seen where the basic line officers, the rank and file were briefed totally on the intelligence that they had. And that's one of the reasons why we're saying, let's get our folks with security clearances so that they can have the ability to view any type of intelligence documents and not any type of water down. It's they get the information that they need to do their jobs and to be safe. Right. So that way they would have been prepared, would have been in the anticipation of what might be coming at them. And I wanna follow up on that in terms of what should go down uh, to the rank and file. Um, your uh, recommendation about creating um, 
a intelligence bureau and the need for training for the intelligence bureau what kind of training do you believe also then needs to be done for the officers uh, regarding uh, dealing with domestic terrorism and dealing with these kinds of threats? Well, that's where they need to look. To give you a quick example, I'll try not to be too long winded. that when I was assigned to the Office of Training at the Secret Service, one of the things we would do, we would go out to the various agencies, military, local, state, and look at how they were doing it. And we'd gather all the information and bring it back with us. And then we'd go through it and see how it would best work for us and our mission. So that's the thing. You have to go out and you try to gather and research all kinds of it, ways that other police officers or police departments or military are utilizing. We'll just use uh, the Civil Dis uh, Disturbance Unit as an example, how they do about it. What kind of equipment do they have? We bring it back. We look at it. We analyze it. Oh, this will work for us. Then we go ahead to the next step. There's a long process to, you know, creating lesson plans and, and that type of work that they need to do. I'm trying to not be So it's a lot of work and it needs to be done bringing best practices and then making sure that everybody on the force has the adequate information is what I'm hearing you say. Correct. Um, I have just a little time left and the issue of the less lethal force that could have been available and wasn't used um, is concerning. Um, in, your in your view, did the violence used by the insurrectionist warrant the use of this lethal lethal force? And uh, with regards to the number of grenadiers that should have been prepared, what would your recommendation be about how many grenadiers we should uh, actually have on the force so that we have that lethal lethal force available? Uh, to answer your first question, just uh, looking at the videos, they're extremely violent. They came prepared and planned to do what they were going to do. As far as actual numbers, certainly the numbers that they had are not sufficient. Uh, we try to stay away again from uh, specifying specific numbers because if we were to go back and we look at the CD unit and their makeup and everything, I don't want to be in a position of auditing my own work. So it's we leave it abroad for them, but they need to do it. Uh, I believe, if I'm correct with my number, three grenadiers is not adequate. That one, would, that's an easy one. That's okay. We don't have enough there. Um, but certainly uh, there, there needs to be more trained and properly equipped uh, people who can use that equipment effectively and safely. Thank you so very much. I yield back. Thanks so much. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Aguilar, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Bolton, in the first flash report, you identify the intelligence and interagency coordination division, the IICD responsibilities, um, and, and you list the six of them, coordinating with the intelligence law enforcement community, identifying potential threats from domestic and foreign entities and groups, advising the Capitol Police Board regarding emerging threats to the Capitol, analyzing and disseminating reports on incidents that may impact the Capitol, serving as a principal point of contact for all intelligence and threat related matters impacting the security of the U.S. Congress, and lastly, maintaining the United States Capitol Police intelligence priority framework and identifying gaps. It seems that the IICD did not meet these responsibilities, I think we can all agree, leading up to and on January 6th. Can you explain where IICD struggled on or before January 6th? and what reforms need to take place so they can carry out their responsibilities? Thank you, sir. Uh, one of the things that, you know, again, coming, uh, people may be tired of uh, referencing my previous employer, but when you generate these security assessments th for that event, those are living documents. You need to, when you provide the leadership or the decision makers uh, subsequent documents, you need to identify whether the information that you provided them in the first place has been resolved, or still pending, or what is the status of it, and then bring into any additional new information. So these are, shouldn't be standalone. That's the thing we saw. There was mis either miscommunication or conflict and not understanding. So the decision makers are seeing different documents and different outcomes or different um, assessments and not knowing if the first assessment, those issues have been either resolved or still pending or, or are still open. 
and it doesn't provide the leadership to be able to act, you know, disseminate and also to take in what they are reading without having that previous knowledge of uh, previous assessments. So there needs to be that flow. Consistency is the, when you have conflicting intelligence reports, one report is saying improbable for we're going to have violence, but another one's talking, oh, it's, it, they're coming after the Capitol, what have you. Where's the consistency? You're getting mixed messages. You, we need to be consistent in producing what we know to the decision makers in a consistent manner. In your reports, you also talk about uh, making previous recommendations that were not followed through um, with with U.S. Capitol Police. So what's your degree of confidence that even if we do come up with you know new framework, new new recommendations, you know how do we how do we ensure that it's institutionalized? You know, in in their body, in that and that recommendations are are followed and adhered to. Well, that's part and parcel of what we do. We do the follow up um, reviews to make sure to ensure that the department is following and keeping the recommendations uh, that they've adopted, that they're still current. So we would that would be part and parcel, of not just intelligence but, division, but throughout. I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, but in your in your flash report, you mentioned some specific cases from from the past where. You, you did issue findings, you were given information, they were cleared, and then you came back, just like you're talking about, which is great, to come back um, and to do a, a review, and then you found, you know, there were more deficiencies. So I guess what I'm asking is, at what, at what period do you say there's systemic issues here that they aren't following through if they're just showing you enough to get by, um, so to say, in a report card versus, you know, versus actually institutionalizing the changes? If it was such, it was, if it's a serious enough issue, and if it, if it was a continuing um, problem, then that would be a coming upon me to notify the committees um, the, of a serious problem. Uh, within the IG uh, community, we have something that's called a seven-day letter, which compels the department to answer certain questions, and those that letter is also uh, sent to the committees of jurisdiction, so they may are made aware of any. Uh, if this, something like that occurred, that we would be able to elevate it to the committees. What's your what's your threshold to send a seven day letter? What at what at what point in which the back and forth um, uh, do you do you would you be frustrated to 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 send a letter? It would be it's a very high threshold in my career as in the Inspector General community. I have only seen one seven day letter issued. Uh, to the committees, and that was from when I was Department of Treasury uh, Office of Inspector General. But it, it would have to be a very serious, if it's something I couldn't work out with the department or with the board, um, and felt that it was such a serious thing that I would have to do, be no choice but to. That's kind of like a last effort thing that you do have to do uh, to, to issue that. Understood. Thank you so much. Yield back, Madam Chair. A gentlelady, uh, Congresswoman Scanlon is now recognized. For five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Lofgren. And I want to start by recognizing the U.S. Capitol Police officers who serve our country and protect the Capitol and all who work here. And to let you know once again that we appreciate your courage, your grace under pressure, and your resilience. Of necessity, today's hearing has to focus on areas in which the policies and procedures of the U.S. Capitol Police need to be improved but should no way be uh, interpreted as any kind of attack on the honor or bravery of the rank and file members of the Capitol Police Force and to whom all of us who serve here and the entire nation uh, owe an eternal debt of gratitude. Um, Inspector General Bolton, just at the outset, I note that each of your reports are entitled Review of the Events Surrounding the January 6, 2021 Takeover of the U.S. Capitol. Can we just be clear that what occurred on January 6 was in no way a peaceful protest? I find that interesting, but just by based on our reports and this has been reported in the news, certainly I can't see how anybody could classify it as a peaceful demonstration. Thank you. Um, in reviewing your reports, um, I'm most struck by the apparent failure in intelligence reports, um, intelligence gathering and analysis by the U.S. Capitol Police leadership. Your reports indicate that 
officials, USCP officials, didn't have a consensus about whether intelligence reports indicated specific known threats to the joint session of Congress. Um, at the outset, you noted that you're testifying before this committee um, and that we conduct oversight, but we were also witnesses to what happened. As a layperson leading into January 6th, I was aware from seeing the social media of Trump supporters in my region that they were organizing in large numbers to come to D.C. in response to the former president's summons and that they planned violence. I screenshotted posts that said, bring your guns. And I asked my office in advance of January 6th whether there were special precautions that we should take to travel to and from the Capitol on that day. So my big question is, why didn't the Capitol Police know? Are they too siloed? Did they ignore evidence? So can you kind of describe overall the department's overall intelligence capabilities? Well, obviously, their intelligence capabilities are uh, as noted in the report. So this is not anything new that, that they need to improve in their capabilities. Yes, we are customers as, as department. We are customers of intelligence. We don't, we're not the active, but certainly we can have trained analysts, a more comprehensive intelligence uh, bureau to assist us to gather that intelligence. Uh, it, it, it's the issue is sometimes it's, it, I'll give you a quick story. I, I, when I was a young um, agent, um, a senior um, agent came to me and said, look, Mike, yeah, we've been to, the president's been to this particular site day in and day out or, uh, numerous times. Just because it worked last time doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work this time. You've got to look at each individual event in a different lens gather what's there, what has changed in the environment, what's going on at the time. So basically he said, Mike, plan for the worst, hope for the best. So you, that you have to have that, again, that kind of goes back to the cultural change. We're, we're looking at it through a different lens. Each and every time the event is occurring, is not the same. You've got to be able to plan, plan for the worst, hope for the best. Yeah, and, and I took that approach on the 6th. I brought food and a change of clothes with me to the Capitol because I didn't know if I'd be able to leave that day. Um, I was particularly interested in your conclusion that, um, I think it was your conclusion, that in the executive branch, Secret Service, um, intelligence drives operations. And does it play the same role with the Capitol Police? Because it feels like there was a gap there. It's certainly not set up to the level of the Secret Service or, you know, or even the FBI. Um, which, which are certainly more comprehensive. Um, we may not need to be getting to that same sort of level as service or FBI, because certainly their uh, jurisdiction and uh, footprint is much larger than the Capitol Police, but certainly we need to be quite a bit better than a division level. We need to be at least a bureau level. Sure. I mean, it feels a little bit like the wake of 9-11 when we had agencies with different um, capabilities, different bits of information who might not have been communicating well enough um, with social media, with a national problem with right wing extremism. Don't we need to make sure that the Capitol Police are able to tap into resources that will able, enable them to adequately um, get that information? Of course, any resource that you can uh, gather or have on you is going to enhance and help you in completing your, your mission and your goals. Thank you. Um, there's, sure. I have one last question that I've just been asked by so many constituents. We've seen over 400 people been arrested and charged with crimes in connection with the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. But on that day itself, only 14 people were arrested. So people want to know, you know, why hundreds of people who were engaged in obviously criminal activity were able to walk away from the Capitol on that day. Is that something you've looked at? And is that part of the process and procedures we need to be looking at? Specifically, we have not looked at that uh, as of yet. That may come into play in our subsequent uh, flash reports when we look at manpower utilization. Uh, we just may not have had the manpower in order to do that at the time. Um, other priorities took precedent over that. First and foremost, yeah. we'll look forward to 
further information on that. I have additional questions and other members may as well. So let me turn now to the ranking member, Mr. Davis, to see if he has additional questions. Uh, I, I do, Madam Chair. Did you want to ask yours first? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Bolton, I, I know from our previous discussions and, and your other testimony today, uh, the Capitol Police Board is not in your purview. Uh, I understand that. We also know the Capitol Police Board is who hires the Inspector General of the Capitol Police. I have a GAO report on the Capitol Police Board for 2017, which I'll ask unanimous consent to enter into the record. I'm assuming the chair said without objection. Thank you. Uh, this report found that the board's scope is very unique compared to other law enforcement bodies. This board has a lot of power. I'm going to quote now from the GAO report. The board has authority for security decisions as well as certain human capital and personnel matters, including the approval of office terminations. The board has a lot of power. The GAO report I reference breaks down 27 authorities over three main categories. As I said, human capital, security, and other. By my count, the chief has only four areas of individual authority. Among other things, the board has the authority to establish regulations for training of the U.S. Capitol Police personnel and approve officers in emergency situations, design, install, and maintain capital security systems. And I can quote even more from this year report, which, as I said, will be in the record. Now, I appreciate your flash reports. I appreciate your recommendations. We had a lot of discussion today in a very good bipartisan way on how do we get better training to our officers? How do we get more officers into the Capitol Police to focus on a new mission of protection rather than just policing? But the GAO report, Mr. Bolton, clearly lays out that it's the Capitol Police Board, this board, that's made up of the House Sergeant in Arms, the Senate Sergeant in Arms, and the Architect of the Capitol that has the authority to implement the recommendations you're making. That's where I think the American people may not understand that it's the political appointees, the House Sergeant in Arms, named by the Speaker of the House, that has the final say on implementing the many good bipartisan agreed to common sense recommendations that you put forward. That's why I think it's important for us as a committee to be able to hear from those House officers, not just you. I want to hear from the people who have purview over the Capitol Police Board because they're on the Capitol Police Board. And I want to know what they are doing and what they have done to actually help or hinder the implementation of many of your recommendations over the years and including now. So when we look ahead, based on your extensive law enforcement experience, give me your opinion. Is this the balance of power between the board and the department, the balance that you see will work in favor of us being able to implement the recommendations you've put forth? Thank you, sir. Uh, that's a difficult question to answer, but I may be able to at least give um, the committees something to think of or think about or have an open and uh, honest discussion. If we were constituted, the Capitol Police, speaking to the Capitol Police, have a similar uh, structure as uh, other federal agencies where you have a director, uh, the director of the police security agency or protective agency. That's the individual that is going to be the person the committees will hold accountable, ultimately has the responsibility of security on the Capitol complex, and then have you know, you have your chief of police who does day-to-day -day operations. So that, that, you know, something that they may want to discuss or look at uh, that avenue uh, for accountability, transparency, having a director um, that is in charge of the overall capital complex security. Um, and that's the person that you would hold responsible or have questions if you needed questions and questions to be answered. You know, that that's something you and I spoke about. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it in the public hearing today, sir. I, I agree. Uh, my fear is, is that without further looking into the structure of what hindered uh, former chief son's ability to respond uh, or prepare for January 6th um, and to address many of the issues and the failures that you laid out in your reports, I'm afraid, though, 
that politics, and we all know from reports, optics got in the way. Um, many of these common sense uh, recommendations you put forth that we agree to uh, won't be implemented because they're really truly controlled by the political side of Washington, D.C. now and into the future if we don't seriously, as this committee, address the Capitol Police Board's inefficiencies, terrible structure, and and issues that we need to go moving forward. I appreciate your recommendation on the director. I think that's something that we need to seriously consider. But also at the same time, I appreciate your recommendations because we do need to look at changing the mission of the force. Better training is necessary, but we can't do that. And we can't we can't trust that any chief, current acting chief or even future chief that the Capitol Police Board may be looking at is going to be able to do that without politics getting in the way. So with that, Madam Chair, thank you for the time and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Um, I would just uh, note that the Capitol Police Board uh, exists because it's in statute and that was enacted into law before I think any of us here were in Congress. Uh, and I, my understanding is that it was um, enacted into law because of the need to coordinate between the Senate and the House. And just an aside, the members of the Capitol Police Board, although I guess in a sense as political figures, were all um, originally appointed by um, Republicans. For Weirdly enough, the architect of the Capitol is an appointment of the president. And uh, Brett Blanton, uh, the architect uh, who sits on the board, was appointed by President Trump. The sergeant of arms of the Senate uh, at the time was Mike Stenger, appointed by Senator Mitch McConnell, and Paul Irving was originally appointed by Speaker John Boehner and carried over in that position by Speaker Pelosi. So it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, help us to try and make this a political discussion because the structure, I think, needs to be reviewed. What replaces it? is is the the challenge something that is professional and accountable and apolitical that's what we all want i i do have a couple of additional questions uh mr attorney general your review uh found uh that there were significant failings of critical equipment on january 6th for example riot shields shattered upon impact and less lethal munitions stocked in the armory or beyond their expiration date. You also reported that officers experienced supply constraints during the insurrection and as a result, unarmed and unescorted civilian employees were sent to deliver less than lethal munitions to officers, but they were hindered by the crowd and fearing for their safety, they left their vehicles and retreated. And you also found that department riot shields were stationed on a deployment bus away from one of the CDU uh, platoons and that that CDU platoon attempted to get to the bus to distribute the shields, but they couldn't do it because the door was locked. And as a result, this particular CDU platoon was required to respond to the crowd without the protection of their riot shields. I'd like to know, you know, who's responsible for ensuring that the sworn officers have up-to-date and effective equipment. Who is uh, responsible uh, for ensuring that officers are armed with the proper equipment before an event like this uh, January 6th uh, uh, event? And I'd like to know how civilian employees ended up being put in the position that they uh, were and how um, the riot shields should have been distributed. And I think we can surmise that the lack of this equipment uh, did, didn't help our brave officers in defending the Capitol and also themselves. Can you address those issues? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, ultimately, uh, I would say it's the responsibility for officers having the proper equipment, training, um, and coordination is going to be your leadership. Not one, like I earlier I said, it's not one particular person it's the leadership of the department, department as a whole. Uh, you are correct. Uh, there were civilians that were placed in that to correct something like that. Uh, we strongly would recommend that um, they have pre-positioned additional munitions. 
um, that are in a secure location within the Capitol, when you have these events, that you don't have to go out and get civilians to come in there to resupply you. You, you have that additional uh, resupply there immediately. Part of the planning is, uh, I was dismayed to see that our decon area for decontamination uh, consisted of bringing cases of water to the officers. That's not a decon, decon, decon area. Those are things, again, I talked about, you plan for the worst and hope for the best. You have all these things. It's easier just to take the stuff that you didn't use and take it, put it back in the army. Uh, having poor policies and procedures caused where munitions were expired uh, up to 2012, 2004. Again, we need good record keeping to be able to make ensure that those things do not happen. Thank you, um, Mr. Attorney General, uh, Inspector General. I turn now to the um, gentleman from Georgia for his questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the opportunity to do another round of questions here. And I also want to say I appreciate the history lesson we got on the Capitol Police Board. Um, but to just be clear, um, as you're right, many of those folks were appointed by Republicans. This is not a partisan line of questioning at all. Uh, it's just we are the body that makes the law and we can change that, but we've got to be able to find out where the issues are so we can get to the bottom of it. No no way is this intended to be a, a political, as, as many people would love this to be a political discussion, this is not the direction that we're coming from. So I have one more question regarding the board, and then I'll move on to some other things. But uh, Mr. Bolton, you stated earlier the Capitol Police Board is not within your purview. I understand that. But if your office does not have the oversight of the board, then who does? I do not know that, sir. Okay, you're unaware of who actually has oversight over the Capitol Police Board. Does anybody? I'm unaware, like I said, sir, they're not within my purview, so that's not something I would um, equate myself to understand, you know, their makeup there. Uh, I concentrate okay, on what's in my purview. I would have to say that is very disturbing that either there isn't accountability over the board or who can hold them uh, accountable or that we don't know that. So that that is very concerning to me and I'm sure other people. So uh, I appreciate uh, your answer on that, but uh, let's move on to something else. So what type of skill set does the department need to bring in to successfully transform to that entity that you were discussing about having an, a somewhat independent intelligence gathering and coordination? What skills do we need to bring in for that? You need to go out and look for, I mean, we're, we're in a DMV area that has intelligence agencies all throughout uh, this area. We need to look for somebody who's actually in, embedded in those, ingrained in that, um, into that field. Uh, even with all of my experience in that, that is a different and completely world uh, that those folks have that skill set. It's not just something you pick up. You could know, could members, uh, excuse me, Mr. Bolton, somebody needs to mute their mic. We've got a feedback, please. Continue, please. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Um, that skill set is a unique skill set, and it is something that actually has to be someone who's actually worked into that field, has kind of integrated themselves in that type of uh, knowledge and skills and abilities. So that's the type of talent we need to go and reach out and search for, not a homegrown, you know, in the you know internal candidates or, but they have to be have a skill set that they know that world inside now and have the connections. Do you anticipate that it's going to require cultural change within the department to actually make this happen, this transition happen? I think it's a, the overall theme would be a entire cultural change in how we go about doing business and rethink about how we're going to go about and conduct and to achieve our absolute mission of securing this capital complex and its visitors staff and the officers. 
Appreciate that. So are there other law enforcement or government entities that the department should be coordinating with and communicating with that they haven't been doing that effectively uh, to date? And how can we improve that process? Uh, we really haven't looked into that part. Part of our uh, flash report is also going to look at the mutual aid agreement. That, that's going to probably be late summer uh, before we get that according to my schedule I have right now. Uh, so we'll be looking at that and be able to answer your question more fully and in depth um, once we've completed that work. Um, one other question. You've talked about the need for a dedicated CDU force within the department. General Andre has recommended the possibility of a dedicated quick reaction force made up of DC National Guard members, among other options. But in your purview, and I know that we discussed this a little bit recently, but in your view, would that be necessary if the Capitol Police established a full-time, well-trained CDU force? Uh, that's harder to sit there. You may always need that. That would be the, uh, for the decision makers. Um, certainly, our recommendation within my purview is a fully dedicated, fully trained and equipped CDU unit would certainly enhance our posture in securing this Capitol complex. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no further questions. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland is now recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Bolton, um, how well prepared do you think uh, the Capitol Police um, force is now to respond to your suggestions to assimilate uh, these proposals and then to put them into action? Well, according to, I guess, the press releases that the department has is appreciative of my recommendations and look forward to uh, working with the committees and the board to implement those recommendations. They acknowledge that there's a lot of work to be done, as we all, I think, are acknowledging that there is a lot of work ahead of us and we need to look for ways to combine all our efforts into one singular goal. Um, do you have confidence that the changes are going to be implemented in time to deal with the threats that are obviously uh, being posed to the U.S. Capitol and to Congress? So someone sent me an article, a political science article, about how the, the, the single most uh, the single most effective predictor of whether there's going to be a successful coup against the government is whether there was a recent unsuccessful coup against the government. And so, I mean, there's just an, an insurrection where they got to the inside of our building, the inside of our operation. And I just, I, I want to know whether this is an emergency situation uh, or you think that we're okay for now as they implement the recommendations you've made. What I can speak to in that regard, sir, is that I believe in the, the rank and file, of the officers and men and women of this department are going to do the best of their ability to keep us safe. Regardless, every day they're going to get up, put on that badge and assume their post. It's up to us to make sure they have the tools and training to accomplish that. But I have confidence in these men and women here at the Capitol Police, those officers to accomplish the mission. Well, I agree with that completely. A lot of these people are my constituents who live in uh, Montgomery and Frederick and Carroll County, Maryland. Uh, Officer Dunn, uh, who um, whose performance I invoked at the uh, the impeachment trial of uh, former President Trump, and who has been widely quoted uh, in the media, um, he performed really heroic service that day. And he was emblematic of hundreds and hundreds of officers who battled under basically medieval style conditions of people coming in and attacking, punching and kicking and stabbing and spearing with sticks and signs and you name it, uh, bear spray and mace and all of this. Um, so, uh, but th that just, that underscores my concern because th th they, fought their hearts out for us as patriots to defend the Congress and the country on January the 6th before. And that there's no doubt they would do it again, but uh, you know, we owe them uh, a rapid transformation of uh, the culture, the intelligence operation, and uh, the operational capability 
of the Capitol Police. So I, I guess um, just to to try one more time, I mean, do you think that the force is actually ready to assimilate, um, you know, the, the magnitude of the suggestions you're making and then to make these changes in time to deal with the next set of threats? I believe uh, the leadership um, within the Capitol Police are certainly open and willing uh, to take our recommendations to heart and to make the changes. I think they're moving towards that. Uh, the good sign there has not been any uh, information that has come my way to indicate otherwise. Okay. Um, all right. And um, you also found uh, no suggestion uh, in any of your investigation that there uh, that there were any kind of deliberate attempts to undermine the response of the Capitol Police on January 6th, did you? That's correct, sir. We have not come across any information that would support that kind of uh, uh, allegations and or uh, information that would present that. So you found a lack of preparedness, a lack of training, uh, some of these structural failures relating to the CDU and so on, but uh, no reason to think that there was a deliberate effort on the Capitol Police essentially to uh, let the marauders and insurrectionists have their way in, at different points. That's correct. No, absolutely no information. That okay. Suggest All right. Th thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back to you. Thank you. As I mentioned at the beginning of this hearing, um, votes were to be called at 2.30, and in fact, 13 votes have been called, uh, which means we will be here until this evening uh, voting. Uh, I will work with the ranking member uh, to uh, reconvene this hearing either tomorrow or next week so that uh, members can ask their additional questions. When we do that, uh, Mr. Stile is up next. We'll start with him and uh, make sure that everyone has an opportunity to fully uh, review this uh, report, uh, this important report and recommendations by Inspector General Bolton. And with that, uh, the committee will be in recess until uh, we announce the uh, the date, uh, which will work out, as I say, with the minority. So we uh, stand in recess. <laughs>